Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity Baptist Church in Sherwood Park. This is an online study that we do every Tuesday night. So if you're part of Trinity, welcome. Feel free to type in a quick hello in the comments section on Facebook if you'd like. Uh, but if you're joining from elsewhere, you can say hello as well or, um, or just sit back and relax. So welcome to you. Um, I always want to remind you that besides this, um, this particular online study that we do every Tuesday, we do have other small groups in our church that are more interactive. And if you would like to get plugged into those, just let me know. You can send me an email uh, or comment below, and, and, and I'll let you know some of the different options that we have going. Many of those things are also online, but they are granted more interactive than what we going on, what we have going on here. Uh, I also want to remind you as well, especially because it's you know, it's kind of dark and cold in the evenings here in winter, and, and we're kind of going through a cold snap right now. So, you know, if, if you're just sitting at home in the evenings and figuring out what to watch on TV, I want to remind you that our church has subscribed to this thing called Right Now Media, which is kind of like a Christian Netflix, so to speak. Uh, there's a lot of good programs and things to watch on there, not just for kids, but for adults. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that yet, I think you can browse through our church website and find a way to sign up for that. If not, then just contact the church office and we'll get you set up. Uh, so just wanted to let you know that. Now, as far as this particular study that we're doing here today, I uh, just want to remind you who are tuning in, that this is a little bit less of a devotional uh, kind of a study. And there are There's those kind of studies and they're really good, uh, but this is more focused on teaching, uh, building up our knowledge base of the Bible. And hopefully modeling some healthy Bible study methods. Um, so anyway, you'll also notice as we get into it, I'm wearing a Blue Jays uniform uh, or jersey because, uh, hey, uh, for one thing, I really, really love sitting in a baseball stadium and watching baseball games, my favorite sport to watch live. But the calendar has just turned to February. And if you know anything about the baseball calendar year, February is the month when spring training starts. So later this month, the Blue Jays are going to be down in Florida starting to do their spring training. Of course, we can't go down there live to see them, but I'm pretty excited this year. They are stacked. If you've been watching the, the news about who they've been signing in the offseason, I'm looking forward to it. So I thought I'd just kind of wear this little bit of levity, but I also want to let you know that I am around tonight. Of course, I'm pre-recording this particular video, but I'll be sitting by my computer Tuesday night as this goes live, and I'll be able to comment and interact with you if you would like. No pressure, but uh, I noticed you guys have been a little quiet on, on Facebook the last few uh, weeks, but uh, let's interact and make it a little bit more fun that way. Uh, so uh, we are in a study of the New Testament book of First Peter, and I'd invite you to grab a, a Bible or an app on your phone to follow along as we go through 1 Peter chapter 2 today. If you don't follow along, trust me, you're probably going to get a little confused, maybe a little bored. Um, now, as a little bit of review, uh, remember the first 12 verses of chapter 1. They talked a lot about how God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have worked together uh, to give us salvation. And then last week, when we got into 1 Peter here, we explored the five key ways that we can respond to salvation. Uh, and we saw that basically for the rest of chapter one and bleeding over a little bit into chapter two. Today, we're going to slow down a little bit in chapter two. We're only going to look at a few verses from verses four to verse 10 of chapter two. If I was going to give this particular bit a title, I know many of your Bibles have subheadings here, uh, but if I was going to give it a title, I would just call it you are a house. You are a house. <laughs> uh, the outline that we're going to look at today, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of this one, worked hard at it. It's got three points, and each one of them starts with the letter D. So, you know, if they were given out extra points for being a stereotypical Baptist preacher, I'd be winning the jackpot tonight. Three points, all with the letter D. That's great alliteration. Uh, so basically, verses four and five talk about a different metaphor. Verses six through eight is a a digression about Christ, and verses 9 and 10 is a declaration about us. All right, so let's get into it. The first little bit, a different metaphor. You are a spiritual house, and that's basically just looking at verses 4 and 5. Here in verses 4 and 5, Peter does do this kind of sudden switch of metaphors. You know, just the verses ahead of these ones, 
he was encouraging us to view ourselves like newborn babies who were craving pure spiritual milk. Um, but all of a sudden, boom, when we switch to this metaphor of us being built into a spiritual house. But notice that both images kind of hang together on this concept of growth, that we are supposed to grow or we're supposed to make progress in the spiritual life. Babies grow, uh, buildings get built. Uh, so let's read this, verse 4 and 5. I'll read it out loud uh, as you guys follow along. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. So just a few key words for us to notice. You might want to circle or underline these if you have the ability to do so. The word stone is really important. We're going to see it multiple times in this passage. Uh, the word rejected is going to be another key word. And the third one is accepted or acceptance. That whole kind of, uh, that whole notion. Uh, the truth that's really shining out here in this passage, though, is that Christ is in this building project with us. Uh, he is the living stone, like capital S stone, as is mentioned in verse 4. He was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And we are also living stones. We are the uh, lowercase s stones, who, uh, again, to remind you of the context here within Peter, historical context, these folks were exiles. They were rejected by other humans, uh, but they were chosen by God. And both of those things, that rejection as exiles and being chosen by God, uh, Peter mentions in the very first two verses of this, uh, this letter. Uh, but we are living stones who are being built by God into a spiritual house. Now, depending upon the Bible that you're reading here tonight, you might see a little footnote uh, there after that little phrase, spiritual house. Uh, some translations would translate this saying that we're being built into a temple of the Spirit, which is awesome. Uh, I mean, I could, I could kind of go into a different diversion about this. Uh, Paul uses very similar imagery in Ephesians chapter 2 to describe us. Uh, but, you know, when you think about the three people of the Trinity, uh, often we are called the people of God or God's people, God the Father's people. That comes up later. We are, uh, we are called in, in some of Paul's letters, the bride of Christ. And uh, here as well, uh, we are being called the temple of the spirit. So wonderful stuff. Anyway, th this imagery, though, it is fascinating, again, because it's about growth and building a building. Uh, but it, it's not about individual growth. It's about the community of faith being grown and built up together. You know, and I wonder during this long COVID season whether this is actually happening a little bit below radar for us in a really neat way, even just with our church family. I think a number of us are being grown and, and built up in the faith uh, in ways that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do without COVID. And we can't communicate all that with each other right now as easily as, as normal, but I wonder if God is doing this in a really neat way for us uh, as we journey through this. So it's not all bad. It's pretty good. Uh, this imagery, though, that, that's being described here of a house, it's obviously based on Israel's temple. Uh, look at the second half of verse 5. Uh, we're being built in this spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting. It's almost like that Peter's mixing metaphors. We're, of course, a house or a temple, but we're also the priest within that temple at the same time. And we're offering these spiritual sacrifices acceptable. There's that key word again, acceptable, to God through Jesus Christ. Um, but let's look at that word priests that's mentioned there. Uh, we're going to come back to that in verse 9, actually. Um, but look at that next little bit about spiritual sacrifices. I'm kind of glad that doesn't mention physical sacrifices. You know, we're not sacrificing animals anymore like they did in the Old Testament. Um, I'd be okay with cats, but I probably shouldn't say that out loud because someone's going to get offended and report me. <laughs> anyway, what really is going on here, though, about spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, it's likely referring to the obedience 
that we are supposed to have to all the commands in Scripture, including commands here in this letter. Uh, this this kind of wording about giving spiritual sacrifices to God, it kind of reminds me of Paul's words in Romans 12, where he tells us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Our obedience, our embodied obedience to Jesus is a spiritual sacrifice to God. Amen. Uh, well, let's move on to the next little section here. Uh, so not a different metaphor. Let's now switch to a, a digression about Christ. And again, this goes from verses 6, 7, and 8. And we're going to see Jesus here being either the rejected or the accepted cornerstone of the house that's being built. Uh, so we're about to step into a lot of Old Testament references in this passage. We're going to see three direct quotes in front of our eyeballs here in this section, but there are also some other verbal allusions that are going to show up a little bit later. Um, to be honest, I won't bore you with this too much, but I have a few fascinating books on my shelf, that uh, my bookshelves, that explore how New Testament writers used the Old Testament. Uh, this is fascinating, again, because New Testament authors, they didn't have a, a New Testament to draw from, really. Um, they didn't even, in many cases, know that they were writing something that would eventually become the New Testament. They were just writing to other people, like we have going on here. But they did have the Jewish Bible to draw from. We, of course, call it the Old Testament. If you're talking to your Jewish friends, call it the Jewish Bible. I think that's more respectful uh, for them. Uh, but these authors here, like Peter and others, they quoted the Jewish Bible extensively. That's what they had. Peter does it, Paul, uh, Luke, who writes both Luke and Acts, he, he does that. So does the Apostle John, and on from there. there. I mean, there's just a lot of examples. But even here, Peter quotes, but he kind of sets us up for it. I mean, back in, in chapter 1, he tells us that the Old Testament prophets had a lot to say in part about the Messiah. So he's kind of teasing us a little bit about this Old Testament saying something. And sure enough, now we get into a number of quotes. So the first quote is in verse 6. And here, again, if you've got footnotes, you can see that he's drawing from Isaiah 28, verse 16. So let's hear it. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, I don't have time to draw out the original context here in Isaiah, but Peter did, of course, see some basic similarities, uh, not just in the words, but in the context that Isaiah was writing in and the context of the Jesus event. And of course, we see some different phrases in here. I lay a stone in Zion signifies God's action here. Uh, and what does he lay down? He lays down a chosen and precious cornerstone. And chosen and precious were, of course, words used in verse 4. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It's a wonderful promise for us. But again, think of our key words here. You could say here, in other words, uh, one who trusts in him will never be rejected. They will always be accepted. There's that rejection and accepting um, phrases that, that we're going to see again. We'll see them next again. Uh, so verse 7. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. To you who believe, this stone is precious. I mean, Christ is precious to us, just as he is to the Father, which was mentioned earlier. But, and we can see that quote that I just read here. This quote is from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected, key word again, has become the cornerstone. Now, just a little bit on the cornerstone. Historical context, uh, the cornerstones seem to be used in some different ways in ancient uh, architecture. But uh, I would think the best way to describe it would be that they would be used, of course, in a foundational kind of corner as part of the foundation. Uh, an important thing to get right because it makes sure that your walls are going to be straight and perpendicular and all that. They were vitally important. Uh, this spring, I, I hope to help a friend build a foundation for his cabin. We'll see how it goes. I don't know if you want my pastor hands around a bunch of tools, but uh, try and help him out, build a really good foundation for that thing, and hopefully the rest of the structure goes well. Uh, so that's a little bit about the historical context of the word cornerstone. 
but a little bit of context, literary context, about this particular quote from Psalm 118. You might not know it just looking at it here, but this particular psalm and this particular verse is a favorite one for New Testament writers. It seemed that Peter and others just intuitively, by the Spirit, knew that this applied to Jesus so well. So this particular verse, it's quoted in the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Luke, uh, Gospel of Mark. It's quoted in the, the Acts of the Apostles. It's quoted in the Epistle to the Romans. Um, it's really popular. Uh, unfortunately, I think all of it is pointing to the same truth, that there's this tragedy that some people can and will be so wrong about Christ, they'll reject him. And um, that, that's not good because he's become the cornerstone. He really is the dividing line. Um, verse 8, of course, uh, it repeats how Jesus has become the cornerstone. But this time the, the imagery is of causing some people to stumble and to fall and not be able to believe in him. Uh, this is a different quote from Isaiah chapter 8. I won't read it all here. But when you look at verses 6, 7, and 8, I want you to notice one other thing that is not said here that I find pretty peculiar. Again, remember some of Peter's story. Even though Jesus, uh, during their time on earth together, uh, he changed Simon's name to Peter, which means rock. Peter never mentions anything about himself as a rock in this passage. Now, again, if you know your Bibles well, you would know that back in Matthew 16, uh, Jesus seems to declare that Peter is a rock on which he's going to build a church. There's some debate about who he's referring to there, but anyway. But this is a place where our Catholic friends would say that Jesus is instituting Peter as the first pope, as the first rock on the church. And, uh, you know, if Peter really took that to heart, if he was all about that and he was going to let that get to his head, um, this particular passage that we're looking at here today would have been the perfect place for Peter to kind of leverage that. But he never, ever hints at it whatsoever. He never talks about himself here as a rock or the, the rock or anything like that. Uh, he's pretty quiet about himself. And I think we'll see that actually a little later on in, in chapter five as well, where he has another amazing opportunity to uh, elevate himself. And he never does. But anyway, what he instead does next in our passage here is he goes on to lift up the lofty and royal status of the whole people of God, of the whole church. And so that's our last D of the day, verses 9 and 10. This is a declaration about us, who we really are as God's people. Uh, these Again, these are solid truths about our identity as Christians, but I would challenge you to not overthink about this um, in the sense of this being applied to you as an individual. This is who we are as a community of faith, as the church of Christ. So let's read verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Oh man, the, the familiar verse, much beloved verse, I think to many of us. There's four titles given to us here in verse 9. Of course, the first one is that we're a chosen people. Again, you can go back up to chapter 1, second verse, uh, it talks about us being chosen. Uh, Peter seems to be alluding here, not a direct uh, quote, but he seems to be alluding to a little phrase at the end of Isaiah 43, verse 20. Well, then we've got these next three titles after this, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, we are God's special possession. And it seems that all of these are, again, um, not a direct quote, but they're, uh, being, uh, there's an allusion there to, at very least, Exodus 19, verse 6. Um, Exodus 19 might not mean a whole lot to you, but again, remember an Israel story line. They're, they're in the desert at this point. They're about to receive the Ten Commandments uh, and, and the Book of the Covenant, and all the importance with that, where God's going to really call them his own people. And in, in uh, Exodus 19, 6, this is what it says. That God's speaking, although the whole earth is mine, true, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Oh, what an amazing truth. All of us, ancient Israel, 
now the modern church of Christ, all of us are the priests of God. We stand in continuity with the Old Testament saints, uh, and we share with them this calling and this lofty status as the priesthood of all believers. And again, I just want to camp out on that just for a minute. There is nothing fundamentally different between me as an ordained Baptist pastor and you as participants in the Church of Christ. You know, and that matters a lot for a whole lot of reasons and for a whole lot of times, but I think it even matters for how churches minister to each other in times like this. Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to care for the flock or, or, or the church that we have, of course, here at Trinity in this time during COVID, doing my best. Um, and I, I hope and I trust that you feel that you can participate as well. In fact, your ministry to other people within our church and our neighborhoods can be just as important and just as effective in God's eyes, maybe even more so than my ministry to others. Um, so don't undersell yourself and the way that God can use you. Well, the passage goes on to say that we're a holy nation. Uh, that sounds pretty bold, but remember, we've been declared holy by God um, when he saved us. And our calling for the rest of our lives is to live into the holiness that God has already declared over us. Uh, of course, again, the last uh, title here that's given to us is that we're God's special possession. Um, and again, that can be kind of that can go kind of sideways a little bit. But I, I remember a sign that was posted. Uh, I think it was like a little bit of a like a poster or something in a friend's office, and the poster basically said, "The church." is God's plan A for reaching the world. The church is God's plan A. There is no plan B. The church is God's plan A. There is no plan B. What a privilege we have to join with God on mission um, to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And that's the purpose of it all. It's not to gloat and to revel in our chosenness. It's so that we can declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. I mean, that's obviously a call to praise him. That's a call to worship. But that's also a call to share our faith with others too, so that those folks can join with us in the truth of verse 10. So let's read that. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I like that parallelism there. Uh, you might not pick up on this, but again, Peter, he's not doing a direct quote, but he's strongly alluding to another Old Testament book, this time the Old Testament prophet of Hosea, chapter 2, verse uh, 23. Um, uh, he's stealing the, the phrases right there. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have. And that's just a reminder for us of what we were not um, without Christ, and now what we are with Christ. But again, this is all by God's amazing grace. Awesome. Well, hey, we've had a great time going through the passage. Can I leave you with, uh, with a question uh, to ponder? Considering the amazing identity that God has given to the Church of Christ, again, not so much about individuals, but to us as the Church of Christ in this passage, how does your attitude and your speech about the church line up? Of course, churches, uh, you know, they can face some fair criticism. None of us should be above um, some good, fair, constructive criticism. But my fear is that for us as Christians who spend so much time in the church, we forget because of familiarity and because of honest disappointments, we forget the high and lofty status of God's people and who he has created it to be. Um, and, you know, we sniffer, you know, and we can have these bad attitudes and we can speak poorly about Christ's church. And when you think about it, that can get downright, uh, well, not good. The way I, I've often described it, maybe you've heard me share this before, is to imagine, uh, well, let's, let's use the analogy of, of the church as Christ's bride. I mentioned that just a little earlier. 
Imagine the processional, you know, at a wedding day where Christ and his bride are coming down the aisle, the radiance of, of the beauty of the bride. And, uh, we know what that's like, uh, humanly speaking. But can you imagine somebody in the audience just kind of loudly kind of critiquing the bride as she's going down, you know, comment, commenting about her weight and, you know, how ugly the dress is and, you know, who they hire for a, a hairstylist here, and, you know, like, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. Like, can you imagine that happening in a, in a regular wedding? I mean, I think people would be really offended and they would put that person in their place right away. You, you don't do that. You don't say that about someone else's bride. And in the same way, the church of Christ is the beloved bride of, of Christ. Um, and so, yes, should we provide constructive criticism so we can grow in holiness? Absolutely, of course, of course, of course. But we've got to be careful with how we talk about the church um, and not give it unfair and gross criticism. That's actually revealing something really sinful about ourselves. And it's selling short the high and lofty status that God himself has given to the church. So that's my question for you. How does your attitude and your speech about the church line up to the lofty status that's given here in this passage? As, as a reminder to you, though, this, this whole passage is telling us you are a house. We are a house, a spiritual house where God is meant to live by his spirit. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in here today. Uh, we're going to go a little bit further into chapter two next week. As always, though, if you've got questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to write them in the comment section here below. Send me a private email if you'd like. But uh, we'll continue on with Peter next week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Have a great rest of the week. Bye.